All right, so uh, why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and uh, your role here at uh, IPS. Uh, I'm Jim Loeb. I, I'm uh, Bureau Chief for Interpress Service, which is an international wire service that deals mainly with issues and events of interest to developing countries and people who are interested in developing countries. So, in other words, your main audience are um, countries, uh, super, like uh, big countries, or actually those small developing countries? Um, uh, my main audience is very difficult to define. Um, but uh, in general, I write for media, um, subscriber media, uh, in developing countries and also in Northern Europe and to some, in some parts of Southern Europe as well, who, which subscribe. But our basic audience are, uh, is found in, in uh, sorry, I'll do that again. Our basic audience is, is found uh, in among English uh, Anglophone papers in East Asia and a number of, of native language papers in, in South Asia in particular, and to some extent Indonesia, in Anglophone Africa, and uh, in virtually all of Latin America. And, and so... Uh, we're we're, we're going to have that problem, I think. Okay. And we'll just... Uh, uh, no, it's in the middle of an interview right now. I'm trying to take a message. Yeah. Do you want to? Yeah, we could probably do that. As long as it, although, you know, the answering machine will still pick them up and then they'll make big noise. Uh, it's probably not best. We won't get that. We shouldn't get many calls. Especially because you could be calling again. Well, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> my my boss from Rome is coming in. It's going okay. to burst in the door at, okay. at, right in the middle of this. All right. So um, during the build-up to the war in Iraq, what kind of stories were you covering for your audience then? Well, I would say that my audience kind of broadened after 9-11 because... Um, uh, I was particularly interested uh, in the kind of rise of, of neoconservatives within the administration and the kind of campaign I felt that they were waging outside the administration. Uh, so I started writing about uh, neoconservative, project for the new American century and so on within, within just a few weeks of 9-11 itself because it seemed to me that what, what the administration was doing in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 uh, had very little to do with a war on bin Laden or Taliban, but was had a part of a much broader strategy and a little research, you know, kind of confirmed my instincts about that. And so I started writing about uh, the project for the New American Century, for example, and neoconservative thinking and um, tilt toward Israel and so on. And as a result of that, my, um, my audience kind of expanded beyond my normal interpress service kind of constituency. So I began writing uh, for a number of different websites, some uh, in the, the United States, others abroad, and uh, at a certain moment for the Daily Star, which is a, an English paper in, in Beirut, which has a large readership in the Middle East as well. Uh, interpress has never been very strong in that region, so it wasn't really competitive. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't uh, traducing or uh, my uh, my responsibilities toward Interpress. So I found there there was a much bigger audience for for the kind of uh, writing I was doing after 9-11. So when you started to hear uh, in late August uh, you know, Dick Cheney speaking about you know, the, this threat from Iraq and mm -hmm. then the public relations campaign that kind of launched in September, what was your perception of what was happening? Did you trust a lot of what was going on or and what were you reporting on? Well, I, I felt that they were going to go to war. That that to the extent that neoconservatives. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, let me take them off. Then. Will that look weird? No, that's no, not okay. sound. Yeah, no, I know. But if you if, if one minute I'm wearing glasses oh, no, and the next right. I'm not. Right. Okay. So and I'm I'm also not going to be uh, including my questions. So no, I understand. Can, I understand. Just, okay, so go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I had felt that uh, just by reading uh, back 
before 9-11 into the 90s, I mean, I'd already kind of looked at what a lot of key people who were obviously very influential uh, within the administration um, were, were writing. It, it was pretty clear to me that Iraq was a was I indeed probably already conceived of as the major target of the quote war on terror back in late 2001 already. So by August 2002 it was very very clear indeed. And I was writing essentially at that time on the conflict that had broken out within the administration as to you know whether there should be a war waged against Iraq, and if so, how it should be waged and how it should be prepared for. That is, do you go through the UN or, you know, what are, what are the ways of preparing the ground for the war? So a lot of what I was writing um, in the summer of 2002 or in the late summer of 2002 was about how clear it had become that you had Cheney and Rumsfeld and neocons around both of them are uh, going for war and how clear it was that Powell was was dragging his feet and I think in in early August I think around August 3rd that was three days I think before Powell finally got a private audience uh, with Bush to persuade him to go through the UN I wrote an article that that actually got some notice that said I, that I couldn't understand why why Powell remained a Secretary of State that I, I thought that, I mean, he really was being used as a fig leaf, a reasonable uh, and trusted fig leaf for uh, really uh, a, a group of extremists who were determined to take the United States to war. And so when you read the mainstream print media, such as the Washington Post and New York Times, do you see that they didn't kind of see the same perspective as you, that the war, in, in a sense, was going to happen and was an inevitable well, you know, when you talk about the mainstream media, you're really talking about a kind of entity that's, uh, that's larger than specific reporters or specific editors. Um, and I'm certain that uh, reporters, uh, certainly for the Times or the Post or whatever, had as much information or more as I did about what was going on. But the, I think the issue is, is that mainstream journalism is practiced within a certain... Uh, a political framework or a cultural framework uh, in which some things can be said and some things cannot be said or some some dots can be connected and other dots cannot be detected uh, connected and uh, I working for a, uh, essentially a, a, an international news agency have much greater freedom to connect dots um, whereas I think people who work for the Times and the Post, particularly those because they're kind of court newspapers uh, and as a result their relationship with people in power is a much more delicate kind of uh, proposition. Um, they, they cannot uh, uh, write things that may on an individual basis be pretty obvious to them um, after you know covering these people for a long period of time. And do you see the reason is that kind of the, the constraints of the objectivity standard that, you know, the journalists here have? Or what do you attribute that to? Why don't they connect those dots more? Well, I think it's, I think because there are political realities that are opposed to that kind of dot connections. That is just, you just can't say certain kinds of things in certain kinds of atmosphere and expect that your editors are going to let it pass and it's going to be printed in a newspaper. I mean, I'm not saying there's active censorship. I, it, most of it exists on the self-censorship and level, I believe, and, and people, you know, become used to censoring themselves and, and feeling the political winds and figuring out what they can get away with and what they cannot get away with. I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. I don't know how, how interesting it may be to you, but if you take... Um, Sorry, I, the fact that Knight Ritter, which is on the um, seventh floor of this building, um, was way, way ahead of the, of the Times and the Post in terms of reporting on what was going on in the Pentagon, the, the way Cheney really was uh, um, exercising a decisive influence within the administration, 
um, uh, the role of uh, someone like Douglas Fife, who'd been really ignored by the Post and the Times for a long, long time. The fact that Knight Ritter was able to, to, to do this with a small uh, investigative staff um, points out the difference between the court newspapers and regional newspapers, or a chain that's a little more independent of Washington kind of power circles. Because the same thing happened during the Iran-Contra period. Knight Ritter, uh, whose team, investigative team, was then headed by a Mexican-born reporter, Alfonso Chardi, uh, really had put the basic elements of Iran-Contra together long before the Times and the Post uh, uh, felt they could write about it on a consistent basis. Now, I'm sure that the Times and the Post had a lot of the information that, that Alfonso Chardi and his group had at the time. But it could not be put together because of a, the political framework in which the Times and the Post operate. And do you think part of that framework is you know, maintaining access with the, the highest officials of government? Do you, think, do you see an influence there that the people who are outside of that access realm have to scramble a little bit more? Or? I think a lot of it has to do with influence. But I think... I'm sorry, what, when you say a lot, what has to do with it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I think the. Oh, yeah, wait. sorry when I lean forward, it doesn't work, right? <laughs> they, they work in a different um, political milieu. Um, and the, the prominence of the Post and the Times and the way they set the news agenda for the rest of the mainstream media. Uh, puts them very much in the spotlight uh, for the powers that be, whereas Knight Ritter can scurry around the edges more, and it doesn't draw as much attention. Um, and that gives them greater freedom. But, but you take the Post and the Times, and they're almost kind of institutions, institutions in the way, arguably, you know, that Congress is an institution. And I'm sure you've come across the writings of somebody like Dan Hallen at the University of California in San Diego, who did kind of the best analysis of the Vietnam War and the relationship of media to uh, um, a change in the view as to that war and so on. And, and it, for him, I, I'm oversimplifying, but the idea was that the reporters look to other institutions for, in a sense, what is permissible to report and what is not, particularly elite reporters. The institution, if it's a matter of, say, foreign policy, the institution they look to for, uh, in a sense, permission as to whether they can publish dissents is Congress and the opposition party in the Congress. And I think the question they raise, though, again, not on a conscious level, I think it's part of the censorship kind of process, is, is there a, a credible uh, uh, weight in the opposition party, a credible number of opposition party people who are raising these questions. And if they find, yes, there, there is, uh, then they'll begin dot connecting. And they can do that pretty efficiently. But if they find that there isn't, that there, the minority dissenting views in Congress are hardly heard, the media will not go out on its own. The re elite media, the, the real agenda setters like the Post and the Times, won't go out on its own and kind of plant the flag and say, look what's going on here. Um, this is awful. And I, what's funny is I think that Congress, people in Congress often look to the press for a similar signals as to whether they can go forward and, you know, plant flags and say, this is really bad. Um, so, it, and at the level of the Times and the Post, you really are talking about kind of an institutional self-conception that, that, that's like that, looking for other institutions to validate what is okay, what is not okay. And in the case of the war in Iraq, after the resolution was passed in early October, there was only a few dissenting viewpoints. So do you see that after that time period, since there wasn't a lot of opposition, therefore the, a lot of the press just followed suit? Right. I mean, they, they, had, a, they had a lot of options. They could really dig as Knight Ritter did. As, I'm citing Knight Ritter because it did the best and consistently the best job of, real, of really investigating what were the roots of this policy and, and what was going on.
that was highly unusual in the policy making process. Um, sorry, I lost the beginning of the sentence. Yeah, yeah just uh, just kind of recap, like after, you know, it seems yeah, like after I remember. October. Yeah, the, the, the media had a lot of options as to how it was going to cover the run up to what was almost certainly going to be a war. And they could have got, they could have done as Knight Ritter did, which was really put in a lot of investigative resources and, and good people into finding out um, what was going on behind the scenes. Why were we going to war? What was the root of all of this? What was going on in the Pentagon in terms of doing the strangest things with intelligence? What was outside of kind of accepted rules of institutional behavior that made this so extraordinary? Or they could decide, uh, as most of the media did, that they would really get involved in kind of the mechanics of war preparation and embedding their journalists into, you know, parts of the army that were going to be involved in the invasion. And, uh, you know, obviously the latter was the easier course, particularly when the only person who was trying to raise hell uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. Was, was Robert Byrd and, to some extent, Al Gore and Senator Kennedy. I mean, the... the these such small voices, although, you know, prominent people, but nonetheless, the fact that people weren't following them made them easy to marginalize them, to marginalize in the, in the, in the mind of, of mainstream media. It's a, it's I should also back up for a sec. I'll say something very controversial, not controversial, but kind of off the wall in a sense. I, I mean, I, I've studied a lot on my own about foreign policy coverage by the mainstream U.S. media in the last century, kind of, and particularly foreign policy coverage of the third world. And I kind of concluded, not that I'm a master of this, but in looking at a number of different crises or foreign policy issues over long periods of time, I kind of concluded that, that, that people fundamentally misunderstand the function of mainstream media. And indeed, journalists themselves, I think, misunderstand it. I think the function of mainstream media is, by and large, to confirm people's existing prejudices each day about how the world works, um, as opposed to providing new information that would challenge those fundamental prejudices, or as Walter Lippmann called them, stereotypes that all of us carry around inside of us and that are mostly culturally um, uh, defined. Um, I, you, I think you can only come to that, that conclusion when you see the existence of the same storylines, the same stereotypes brought up again and again and again over long periods of time with respect to this or that enemy, uh, uh, rather than serious challenge, challenging of those those kinds of stereotypes or storylines, and so when you're covering it, you you're working outside of that those blinders in a way that you're. Do you try to challenge the the viewpoints of a, a lot of the the cultural biases? Well, I mean, I'm a product of the culture too, and to that extent, you know, my coverage is going to be affected by what my you know what my cultural upbringing says is possible and impossible. I mean, for me, to example. For, sorry, to me, for example, it, it's inconceivable that the Bush administration would have been behind the 9-11 attacks. Uh, now, if I were brought up in an entirely different culture, it might, that might, I might be not nearly as dismissive of the notion. But being American-born and American-bred and having watched Mickey Mouse Club and, you know, um, read standard U.S. texts in the 50s and early 60s, it's just inconceivable to me that uh, an American administration would, would do an atrocity like that deliberately. It's just I can't get my mind around it. But others, you know, I'm willing to accept that others outside the culture who didn't watch Mickey Mouse Club would think that, whoa, well, yeah, well, it could be possible. Going back to the, uh, the dot connecting leading up to the, the war in Iraq, it, it seems to me that the mainstream media wasn't asking a lot of questions as to why the root causes, you know, looking beyond what the administration was saying with weapons of mass destruction. And so from your vantage point and what you've looked at from 
you know, the connections to Israel, for example, the oil, or what do you see as some of the reasons as to why this war happened? Well, um, I've, I viewed it, I viewed the notion that uh, the uh, Bush administration wanted the oil in Iraq uh, as, as pretty ridiculous from the beginning. Um, uh, if for no other reason, then it was very clear that oil companies or people who are very closely associated with big oil, like, like James Baker, uh, were raising all kinds of red flags about the decision to invade Iraq. I mean, uh, or for that matter, Brent Scowcroft, who was probably the most uh, articulate and influential. I mean, he, he, you know, he represents a lot of big interests that are associated with oil, and he, he was very clearly opposed to the whole idea. So. Uh, to me, um, I can't remember when I wrote an article, but I wrote an article, I think, called something like Of Israel and Intimidation. And I saw um, the primary motives for going to war as, one, an effort to uh, kind of decisively reshape the balance of, of, of power or forces within the um, Middle East in Israel's favor. Uh, and that, I think, was the principal motive of the, let's call them mainline neoconservative movement. And the Christian right, which pretty much has deferred um, to uh, the neo neoconservatives on, on issues having to do with Israel. Uh, but I also saw it as part of a large geostrategic strategy that dates back to a paper that was written by uh, De uh, Deputy Defense Secretary Wolfowitz and um, Lewis Libby, who's uh, Vice President Cheney's Chief of Staff and a very smooth operator, um, a, a paper that they wrote uh, while they were both serving in the Pentagon in 1992, which essentially called for the United States to um, ensure that, sorry, I'll go back. Okay, um, <clears throat> in 1992, um, Wolfowitz and Libby, Libby being Scooter Libby, uh, the Vice President's Chief of Staff, wrote uh, a, a notorious kind of paper which was then kind of quashed by the older Bush administration, saying, proposing that uh, strategically the United States uh, maintain its dominance, its military dominance, over Eurasia and prevent the rise of any conceivable rival, not just on a global basis, but even on a regional basis. And that the key to doing that was to assert a mastery or a dominance of vital, of areas of, uh, that held vital natural resources that would be needed by any rival in order to develop to an extent that it could threaten U.S. power. And in that respect, I think the decision to go into Iraq w was, try was an attempt to be a kind of demonstration project, particularly to, to China, to say, you desperately need oil, and local sources will not give you enough oil for your development. You, you will have to rely on Gulf oil, and we can cut it off if absolutely necessary. Uh, so it's much better to, um, to deal with us uh, and to take fully into account what we want than to try to challenge us because we can really do you and your economy immense damage if we feel that it's in our interest. So I think it was, it was serving a kind of regional purpose in favor of Israel's uh, 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 military dominance of the region and hopefully political acceptance by the region in uh, its ability to, to, to dictate terms of a final peace agreement between it and Palestinians and it and the Arab world in general. And then a more global strategy which was to show that uh, potential rivals really could not hope to uh, threaten the United States in any way because the United States was able to, to um, strike them where it, it hurt the greatest, where it hurt their economy the most. So just to kind of summarize that point, what I get is it's about oil. It was really it's, long, huh? But it's, Sorry. It's, uh, it's about 
preventing other people from gaining on oil, not necessarily the United States using it for our own economy. So if you right. could just summarize that. Yeah, again. okay. Yeah, there was this regional strategy, and then there was this larger global strategic strategy, which was essentially to prevent the emergence of a rival power by demonstrating to such potential powers that it could cut off their supply of oil and gas, su supplies that they desperately needed to really become competitive with the United States. This strategy of denying possible rivals um, uh, energy resources has a history. I mean, we now know that plans for intervention in Saudi Arabia during most of the Cold War was not, were not so much based on the idea of securing that oil for the United States as it was of actually destroying oil wells or capping them in ways that the Soviet Union could not use them ever. So uh, the sense of den the denying resources that rivals would need is, is doesn't just date from, from the Gulf War. And can you kind of talk about the neoconservative viewpoint of, of wanting to maintain the superpower status economically and militarily and the importance of that to the neoconservative movement? I think it's a complex, uh, the, the notion, the, the, the larger geostrategic strategy is not just a neoconservative notion. Um, I, I, I see neoconservatives, the, kind of the core of the movement as kind of revolving around um, and being based upon certain ideas around the fate of Jews after the Holocaust. A, a very important aspect of which is Israel. And I should say these are neoconservatives who are both Jews and, and Gentiles, feel a special kind of moral obligation around that issue. Um, the larger geostrategic issues uh, or strategy is, as I say, it's not solely neoconservative. It's people like Donald Rumsfeld, who's certainly not a neoconservative, can they're enthusiastic about this. Uh, um, aggressive American nationalists have, have always, you know, favored the idea of American domination or suprem supremacy at the, at, the global, at the global level, if possible. Um, so to me, this is not a particularly neoconservative idea. However, in a sense, the search for the kind of security that is supposed to come with the idea of military supremacy and dominance, I think does come, is also at the core of the neoconservative movement and personally I believe also comes out of the experience of Jews, particularly in the 20th century and particularly relating to the Holocaust, that there is a kind of need for absolute security which they believe is ultimately will be determined by military force. That that's one of the lessons they take from the rise of Nazism, Munich, and the Holocaust itself. That you really need to, uh, the, the, ultimately the only way to really protect yourself is through force and by having military power and military dominance. Because then potential Hitlers will never dare to challenge you. And I think a part of that also for neoconservatives is a belief that the United States is morally superior. That is, it's better to have a dominant, to exercise, it's better for there to be a dominant military power of the morality of the United States than to have a kind of multipolar world in which powers that are not nearly as moral as the United States, like France, like China, like Russia, uh, can actually um, get their way, that that's necessarily going to be bad for the world. They, they equate uh, American influence with, with goodness in the world. It's, it, it, to me, neoconservatives have a much, much more of a moral vision of foreign policy than a political vision. They, they exist in a moral world rather than a, in a world of, of, of politics, although they, they play political, they, they play the political game very well. 
I didn't explain that very well, did I? Well, I guess that um, <laughs> to me, what I'm what I'm getting is, it seems that there's a lot of uh, emphasis on military security, and then mm. the emphasis of international law, trying to right. abide by international law, and if everyone kind of right. played in the same boat, then that would bring you another sort of security. So, yeah. can you talk about like the military versus international law perspective? Yeah. Um, this also, uh, the, the question of, of, of international law and multilateral institutions that are supposed to be reciprocal in nature and that create international law together uh, is, a, uh, is a notion that um, illustrates the kind of the moral dimension of neoconservative thought in any event. Uh, I think, again, neoconservatives took the lessons of the, of the Nazi period and the Holocaust as meaning that ultimately uh, uh, international law doesn't mean anything. That ultimately is just a piece of paper that can be torn up and that what really matters is military force. And if Britain and France would have had overwhelming military power in the mid to late 30s and were willing to exercise that power, then Hitler would have gone nowhere. And they, they derive that, therefore, they believe that it is the responsibility of democratic states, which, because their democracies are already considered superior to autocratic states or totalitarian states in a moral sense, it is for them to become militarily very powerful, to deter potential autocrats or Hitlers from getting anywhere. That, that, now, and as to the international law part or the multilateral institutions, I think their view is based more or less, again, on the sense of morality. They believe that the United States and Israel, whose, whose fates they say explicitly are, are kind of linked on a moral plane, um, are bringers of good to the world. And that the United States, on its own, has, has the highest morality. And the more it extends its influence in the world, the better off the rest of the world will be in a moral sense. And therefore, they would think that it's kind of immoral for the United States to constrain its freedom of action, its freedom to bring goodness to the world, by agreeing to uh, uh, to restrain its actions by lesserly, lesser powers who are not as moral as the United States. It didn't explain just, it very just, well. Uh, just to recap that point where you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, they see uh, bringing uh, democracy to gunpoint, essentially, in Iraq. They're going to go bring good democracy to Iraq with gunpoint, and, but yet the well, you see, I think that's a really that difficult a issue. Well, in a, because I think, as an aside, they use democracy, I think, primarily as a way of rallying opinion behind them. I'm not sure they care that much about democracy. They prefer it to other forms. If, they, if, if all their other interests will be taken care of, democracy is really is a good thing. But they're, they're more, again, I think they're, they're operating on a somewhat different plane. And the issue is, by definition, if the United States extends its influence, the world will be, be a better place in a moral sense. The world will be more redeemed, to use a Puritan world, a word that dates from the beginning of the country. This isn't just a kind of neoconservative idea about America's goodness and its mission in the world, but the neocons have really adopted this in a big way or, or jumped on it. If the United States agrees to a, a piece of paper, to abide by a piece of paper that, for example, could, would lead to its inability to have the most powerful weapons in the world, it is by definition an immoral proposition because it means that the United States is constrained from being more powerful or being militarily dominant. And ultimately the world will be better if the United States is military do militarily dominant. I think that's one of the points I make or I would make. If, if the United States agrees to constrain its action by, with the UN Security Council, that it will only go to war if the UN Security Council votes to approve the war, that is by definition immoral. 
And they have a point in a way, because let's take the example now of Darfur in Sudan. And let's assume that we can all agree that genocide is taking place in Darfur at the moment. But China gets a lot of oil from Sudan, and China will not be happy about the idea of an intervention in Sudan, and will probably be willing to veto uh, a Security Council resolution. Should the United States defer to China's calculation of its national interest in vetoing the Security Council? No. If you accept that there's a genocide going on, you have an obligation to intervene, a moral obligation to intervene that takes us right back to the Holocaust, right? So they're saying the idea that the United States should, should sacrifice its moral greatness to a Security Council that consists of moral lessers or amoral countries like France, they always cite France, or Russia or China is by by definition immoral. And when I talk to Human Rights Watch, they make a distinction where they actually support humanitarian interventions when there is an imminent genocide or, or one ongoing. But in the case of Iraq, there was no imminent genocide. It happened ten years ago when they tried to indict Saddam as a war criminal. It, it didn't happen, and and so there was legal options there, but in the case of Iraq, it wasn't just a simple veto, it was the majority of not only the Security Council, but the world. So can you... Well, no, I'm, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying the neoconservative position on this is right. I'm trying to, to depict what I think is their worldview and the best way to defend their worldview about the question that you raise about international law and, and con constraining U.S. behavior to multilateral ins institutions. I mean, I think that's right. The, the United States went to war for aggressive purposes and that the U UN Security Council could see that and was prepared to vote in a majority and a pretty overwhelming majority against approving uh, uh, the U.S. going to war, I think uh, makes the case that it was an aggressive war even stronger than it would otherwise be. But again, if you're of a mindset, and I'm not saying this is the case with Iraq, um, if you're of that, we're going to be interviewed by my boss, or interrupted by my boss. Hi, Miran. <laughs> Can we find a chair for her? Yeah, there is one. Okay. She may also want to use the computer, which would be yours, Eli. Since she's la jefa, la jefa. <laughs> okay, sorry. So you were, uh, oh, no, we just, uh, wait. So uh, you were, you're about to. Make what a was pop. I talking you're, you're about? Talking about uh, neoconservative thought in a way towards uh, the UN in regards to Iraq. Right. Um, I think I just made the point that the fact that the Security Council voted or was prepared to vote so overwhelmingly against intervention makes stronger the notion that this was indeed a war of aggression. But uh, you know that said, again, you you have to ask yourself, well, what what do you do about a situation like Sudan with respect to the U.S. obligation to either defer to or to defy the U.N. Security Council. I mean, I think it's hard to defend the notion that uh, the United States should at all times defer to the U.N. Security Council, but many people believe, uh, who oppose this war, believe that should be the U.S. position. Okay. And, yeah, I, I think I... I mean, th there's also an argument, I mean, that I've heard, especially in Europe, uh, is that uh, I think Human Rights Watch is right to set there should be, to say that there is a number of criteria that should be, that should be uh, satisfied before you decide to defy the UN Security Council. But ultimately, you should defy the UN Security Council if the moral situation requires it. Again, a lot of the human rights movement, I think, exists in a kind of moral world that was largely defined by the Holocaust. But at the same, you know, the, the, the cost to international law and to the health and strength of multilateral institutions of that is, is, very, is potentially very great. And when you talk about the, the moral motivations of the neoconservatives, or even the conservatives, if you want to uh, everyone, anyone who I wouldn't use the word conservatives 
with respect to the Iraq War, because I think most American conservatives, in the true sense, opposed it. But. So, I, and, and I've noticed you've done some writing for Lou Rockwell. And, no, and I don't you, write for you, Lou Rockwell. Oh, okay, so he they, republishes they, stuff okay, that I write. Okay, so you yourself are not necessarily a libertarian. No, I'm not a libertarian. Okay. No. But, uh, so, can you make that distinction between kind of the libertarian perspective versus the true conservative perspective on military interventions? Um, no, I, do, I, I mean, again, I think the true conservative, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I think neoconservatives are radicals in a lot of ways, in that they don't have much um, respect for uh, history, uh, that to the extent that they take history into account at all in assessing what to do or not to do in a given situation. It's completely dominated by the rise of Nazism in Germany and what followed from that, and that they're just not that sensitive to the particularities of, of, of regions and different cultures and different histories um, that makes up the complexity of the world. I think that's one of the reasons they ma have made mistakes constantly for the last 30 years in assessing uh, uh, different crisis areas and so on. Um, I think uh, conservatives tend either to be realists of the Scowcroft and Baker variety, which is a very pragmatic uh, um, assessment of how to maintain stability in any particular region so that you do not uh, so that your national interests in that stability are not prejudiced in any way, or who, who are more conservative than that in the sense that we really should, you know, respect uh, national and cultural traditions that we don't understand and we shouldn't try to radically alter them overnight, least of all through military intervention. I think that's, that's what conservatism or conservative foreign, foreign policy would normally be. But what we've seen in the last, um, I since 9-11, is a much more radical uh, approach to foreign policy. I mean, never in American history has the idea been that you need overwhelming military force at all times to be able to project anywhere in which your interests may be affected. Uh, has that held much sway? Y you can argue that when the United States first, you know, began looking overseas and fought its first uh, kind of imperial war, which is 1898 to 1902, the Spanish-American War, you can say that with respect to the Caribbean Basin, there was a desire to assert military supremacy in that way. But, um, but that was a, a, a relatively kind of brief period. Uh, you know, as you know, most times after major wars in the United States, there's been a major, huge demobilization and so on. We, we've never really demobilized. The, the, we're, in, we're in terra incognita now. I, uh, under no circumstances would I call the means that have been used to pursue U.S. foreign policy since 9-11 conservative. And when you look at how the uh, administration um, tried to manufacture consent and the different persuasion tactics that they used, you know, links to Al-Qaeda, mm -hmm. you know, directly with 9-11, insinuating that, but also weapons of mass destruction. When you're evaluating these claims during the buildup, you know, how did you cover that? Were you skeptical or did you believe that they had weapons of mass destruction? Or what were your kind of thoughts when that time period? I think on the issue of weapons of mass destruction, I was surprised that none were found. Um, I think I pretty much accepted that in part because I never really focused on the issue in my coverage. I mean, I talked with Scott Ritter a couple of times, but I think that came after the war. Um, I was paying a little attention to what he and a few others were saying, but probably not as much as I should under the circumstances. Um, on the question of Al-Qaeda, yeah, I was writing stuff that said that the, the case looked full of ho holes, and I was very attentive to that part of the equation, and uh, they're just, I, I was just never persuaded. And at one point I did a uh, rather long article, quite long article for my purposes, on how this notion of Al the Al-Qaeda connection, and particularly with respect to 9-11, you know, how it originated, how it got into the media, and, and it was clearly people who were uh, 
uh, who were neoconservatives, who were out both kind of outside the administration and inside the administration, had access, very excellent access to the administration, including classified data. I mean, Richard Pearl, James Woolsey, Bill Crystal were the, the first two were on the Defense Policy Board, and uh, and Crystal, who's very close to both of them, um, they were all saying within 24 hours that you know basically saying you know this this. Iraq must have played some role in this, and uh, it was very clear to me that there was an orchestrated campaign to link the two. So I was very suspicious of it. Okay, and, okay. and, um, and when you talked a little bit about the uh, institutional irregularities at the Pentagon, such as the, uh, the stovepipe in your office of special plans, mm -hmm. you know, when, was that on your radar screen leading up to the war, and what type of, or, was, or even after, you know, what kind of insights do you have on uh, kind of the uh, going outside of the regular rules of intelligence flow of the chain of command? Well, I mean, to me, it was pretty clear. I mean, uh, I mean, I had a couple of sources myself, but the reporting on this, you know, you, you, you tip your hats to, in this case, Knight Ritter. Okay, I'm sorry, when you say this, we just... Sorry, just when you, I tip, on the question of um, the misuse of intelligence and uh, the Office of Special Plans and, and other groups. I mean, what pretty much helped me understand it, of course, was Cy Hirsch's article in The New Yorker and the coverage of uh, Knight Ritter. And then I had a long interview with Karen Kwiatkowski, uh, who obviously had kind of a, an inside look at all of this. And I still think a great deal remains to be um, made public about how how this worked, uh, but it, for me it was a it was a, it was an an issue that was naturally interesting just because I've naturally been interested in neoconservatives for almost thirty years, and this seemed to be uh, an example of 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 how they would work. I mean, essentially, what they were creating was another Team B within the government. Team B being a reference to the mid-70s, which was used to uh, uh, discredit the CIA's estimates about the Soviet Union. I mean, that was a classic kind of neoconservative uh, maneuver uh, in conjunction with people like Donald Rumsfeld to marginalize what the professional intelligence people were telling the Ford administration uh, and make the Soviet Union look much more dangerous than it really was. Uh, and the way in which they kind of uh, replicated this uh, in the run-up to the war within the administration, within the Pentagon, uh, and the vice president's office effectively just kind of matched that perfectly. And it was also reminiscent of, you know, Iran-Contra. I mean, if you don't like what the professionals or Congress is telling you, then, you know, create your own institutions. <laughs> To, to, to tell you the things you want to hear or you want to do uh, in the case of Iran-Contra. And the fact there was overlap between some of the personalities who were involved in Iran-Contra and, and, and these guys, like, you know, Ledeen being a consultant to, to the Pentagon during this period, and that he helped facilitate uh, contact with Manikur Gorbanifar, who was one of the central people of the Iran-Contra, Period. I mean, it was like too good to be true. So, can you uh, talk? Oh, oh okay. this is a, this is a distraction. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the? Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my, my train of thought. The uh, a lot of the framing of the issue now is that it was an intelligence failure. Can you talk a little bit about your sense of, you know? what's happening with that and does it go beyond just being presented with bad information? Well, I think the story of the day today is that, the, you know, the CIA in, failed massively in, in particularly on the weapons issue. And I, I don't think there's much question of this. But again, this is an institution or these are, in, we're talking about institutions which consists of people who make decisions. Um, and they make decisions within a larger f political framework. And the degree to which the political framework on this uh, w said, you've got to find reasons for going to war, I think was, uh, were overwhelming to an institution 
even one that is supposed to pride itself on its independence, like the CIA. And particularly when you've got a very political head of the CIA, like George Tenet, who will not, has proven that he would not stand up uh, to political pressure on behalf of his analysts. Um, so uh, I think as we find out more about how the White House uh, used intelligence and what intelligence it got from what sources, we'll find again that the, the professionals uh, were much more on target about the actual state of affairs in Iraq or with the relationship with Al-Qaeda or even on weapons of mass destruction um, than the amateurs who were brought in by uh, the Pentagon, by, by um, Douglas Feith and, and Paul Wolfowitz, to find the intelligence that they needed to justify what they wanted to do. And when you mentioned Israel earlier, I think one of the challenges for you know, as a filmmaker, since it's not covered at all, mm -hmm. the, the issue of Israel has hardly ever gone into a, in depth. Can you give kind of like an overview of our why we support Israel and, and, and why we would have gone to war in Iraq to also protect Israel, kind of link those two in the context of the buildup to the, the war in Iraq? Well, I, I think Israel is a very sensitive issue in public discourse um, in this country. Um, it, uh, Israel and anti-Semitism. And um, if you say certain kinds of things, you will undoubtedly be accused by people uh, of being anti-Semitic, or in a case like mine, a self-hating Jew. Um, uh, I think, um, uh, I mean, for, for one, well, I think that the, the, the question of why it's, why it's so sensitive um, is, a, is a very difficult and politically charged one to answer. But, I mean, I can say, for ex just as an example, I got a call from an assistant producer of a major network um, public affairs show, which I cannot make. It was one of the commercial networks. Quite early, well before the Iraq War, saying that this person had been reading my stuff and said that, you know, she's pretty persuaded by what I was writing, that their neoconservatives were driving the policy, that their, uh, one of their main goals was their notion of enhancing the security and power of Israel uh, in the region and ending one of its alleged th threats to its existence. Um, but when that person took it up, to as a potential story, I mean, it was immediately knocked down as um, either a kind of preposterous notion that had conspiracy theory elements to it, although I don't see necessarily any conspiracy, and um, or or B uh, that um, it was just too politically sensitive to to raise because the costs for raising it would be severe. I mean, General Anthony Zinni made that abundantly clear in his famous interview of, what, six weeks ago on 60 Minutes, that, you know, just by suggesting that uh, those people who favored the war might have the interests of, of Israel as well as the United States in mind, uh, just for even suggesting that, you know, he was labeled an anti-Semite and even uh, a traitor in certain circles. Um, so the costs... Uh, you know, can be can be very great, and that has an intimidating effect on public discourse. And I think neoconservatives, in particular, have been very effective at making that um, making talk of that very difficult, or or the consequences very um, severe. I, I mean, I can tell you, uh, before the war or and during the war, I was. Um, interviewed by Australian Broadcasting Company, by the British Broadcasting Company, for, and which produced a very big documentary that created enormous controversy even within the UK. But in the case of those two, as well as a couple others, the principal issue was who are the neoconservatives? What do they think? What is it, their relationship, if any, with, uh, with Israel? What kind of, you know, um, 
I mean, not in terms of a subversive relationship or an underhanded relationship, but how, do they, how does Israel fit into their world and particularly into their enthusiasm for this war and so on. And, and even in, the, in those two countries, um, the, the programs that resulted from that created considerable controversy. Uh, and um, I understand from the BBC uh, program that ran, in which I was one of oh, probably seven or eight people who were interviewed, um, uh, Richard Pearl and a couple other people at American Enterprise Institute said they would never talk to BBC again because they considered it so anti-Semitic. And that's a very, to be charged with anti-Semitism is essentially to be charged with evil. I mean, it's, it's about as bad an epithet in the uh, post-Holocaust uh, uh, environment uh, as one can be accused of. And uh, it's, it, it, it makes people reflect and feel very bad about any notion that they may have lent sucker to anti-Semites or anything like that. It's a, it's a heavy, heavy charge. And I think that that rules over a lot of this. And I just want to get that, you know, clarify and just get that, you know, as a, encapsulate the idea that, that a major network came to you and wanted to do a story on some of the writing that you were doing. Well, not a network qua network, right? But a, a, a person who worked in the network. Okay, so before the recap, Iraq war. Okay, so just recap that again. And, and the reason why I got killed, because you think that Israel was too controversial of, a, of an issue, is too conspiratorial. It's not in the New York Times, Washington Post, so it's outside the mainstream. Uh, well, I mean, I can't say why it was killed. But a, 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 an assistant producer came and said that that person had been reading my uh, material and had become persuaded that really... This was a war that, as Tom Friedman in the New York Times told an Israeli newspaper, if you had taken 24 individuals and put them on a desert island in 19, early 1982, this war would not have happened. I mean, Friedman said as much as that. Uh, uh, and I was arguing at the time that if you look at the writings of Project for New American Century and other groups of people who signed the project statements and so on, are affiliated with, you can see that there's a relatively small group of people, some of whom are in the administration, some of whom are outside the administration, who really want this war for these reasons, one of them having to do with um, uh, enhancing the security and, uh, uh, of Israel and changing the balance of power in the region in its favor in a decisive manner. Um, and this person was persuaded by what I was writing, apparently, and raised the possibility of taking on this question of what is the project for the new American century and who are the people who are involved in it and what have they said to um, higher-ups in the organization. And it was immediately quashed. And this was before the war. Now I think it would probably get more of a hearing particularly when you have Zinni on 60 Minutes. I mean, people would take it more seriously in the mainstream press because it's more respectable to say that. But I would also argue that the Post and the Times have still not really dealt with, with that question of what is the project for the new American century? W who are these people? And what, what other associations have they you know, been involved with? And what positions have they and these associations taken over the years with respect to the Middle East? or even respect to uh, Israel-Palestinian issues and so on. Do they, are, are their views consistent with that of the Bush administration, that the Palestinians should have their own viable state? In many cases, the answer is no, you know, as an example. And again, it's just a matter of connecting dots, but you don't have to be conspiracy-minded. The, they have left a very public paper trail. It's very easy to put the dots together. This is not, certainly not a conspiracy, because it's all, have all, it's all on the record. Which raises the question, why can't the Post and the Times still, after all this time, really examine that record? So you looked at they're only doing day-to-day -day events and not looking at the record over time, or history in, in general? Like, oh, there's not a lot of investigative reporting? In they're choosing way. not to look at, at a history, of which they, some of them must, must be aware. I mean, you, you know, look at the Ju Judith Miller, which I'm sure you're, in, you know, spending a lot of time on. But look, I mean, there, 
as you probably know, there's a, there was this public relations firm that was put together in 2001. Uh, Elena Benador, whom I've interviewed and who's a perfectly charming person, she runs uh, essentially a, a, public, uh, a public relations firm for a who's who of prominent neoconservatives. Um, it's amazing who she's lined up. And all of them are kind of uh, polemicists. I mean, they're, they're people who, whose positions are very well known. But in the middle of this list, as of as late as mid-2002, there was Judith Miller. She was the only straight journalist uh, in the entire group uh, that consisted of people like Michael Ledeen and Richard Pearl and James Woolsey and all the all the people outside the administration who were cheerleading the war and who were neoconservative in, in orientation.